This is She's on Call, a weekly show hosted by ENT specialist Dr. Sajana Chandra Shaker and general surgeon Dr. Marina Kurian. They'll be joined by guest experts to discuss an array of newsworthy medical and health issues. You're invited to ask the doctors anything. The physicians and their guests' views are their own and do not represent any institution or for any personal questions. Please hit share and join us live on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube at She's On Call. Hashtag She's On Call. Please welcome our hosts. Hi, I'm Dr. Sujana Chandrasekhar. I'm an otolaryngologist, which is an ear, nose, and throat surgeon with a specialty in ear surgery. And I practice in New York and New Jersey with ENT and Allergy Associates. I'm Dr. Marina Curian. I'm a general surgeon. I do a lot of laparoscopic or minimally invasive surgery, including some weight loss surgery and weight loss management here in New York City. Welcome to our second show. Marina, I can't believe we had over 5,000 views for our first show last week. That was fantastic. I think that has a lot to do with our team behind us and also our partnership with Scroll In, which is uh, one of the leading news organizations in, in India and it's watched internationally. So thank you guys for tuning in. Please take a moment to like and share and subscribe. You can see us on at She's On Call on Facebook, on Twitter, on YouTube, on uh, LinkedIn. And please let your friends know. I hope you know somebody who might be interested in watching the show. Please uh, ask them to come along and watch with us and send in any questions, any comments. We'd love to make this as interactive as possible. Yep, we're gonna, we, when you send in questions, we're gonna be able to answer them for you. Today we have a great show, but first, we wanna say happy Father's Day. And I know it's Father's Day and you guys are all like, why are you having a show? But you know what? Everybody can learn any day of the week and maybe this will be something fun and make you learn and laugh. So happy Father's Day to my dad, Zachariah Kurian. So and happy Father's Day to my appa, Dr. Hosekeri Chandrasekhar, and to all those watching. And it's a somber day for people who have lost their fathers, uh, particularly during COVID and during the uprisings here. Um, and we send our love to all the families who are watching. Um, what we do on the show is we have our format is that we're going to talk a little bit about the news topics that have come out in the past week. And then we have two fantastic guests that are joining us every week. This week, Dr. Nadia Hernandez, she's an anesthesiologist down in Houston. Oh, Houston, right? Anyway, and then yep. Dr. Dr. Lola Lee, who is a ENT resident in DC. So Marina, maybe we'll start off by just explaining the name of our show. Uh, people ask me why she's on call. And um, I, I love the name of our show. And I wonder if you want to share some of our thoughts about it. So she's on call. We we came up with silly names, right? Like, well, not silly, but kind of boring, like women doctors talking. It just seems so like, you know, too too concrete, too not fun. And uh, actually, uh, one of our team, Rose Horowitz, she was talking about it with her family and her husband actually said, why not call it she's on call, which is kind of cool. And um, a lot of it is, you know, when we when I talk to my patients and they're like, I'm going to see my PCP, I'm like, oh, okay, what's his name? So I can put it in my thing. And I think to myself, wait, it could be, is it a she? <laughs> you know, so I make that same mistake. And I thought this was just a cool way to let really bring out the fact that women in women uh, are in medicine and uh, we are on call. We are answering questions for people every day, not just our patients, but families and neighbors and other people. Um, so, you know, what were your thoughts about it? Yeah, I agree. I think um, we are on call. You and I have been on call for a couple of decades now since we started our residency training. Um, and it's one of the joys, really, of having some knowledge base where people in the street or at a rock concert or at a bar mitzvah can come to you. So I had a couple of funny incidents of being on call uh, when I was all gussied up. So my one of my best friends was getting married and the ring bearer had a fishbone stuck in his tonsil. He just ate wrong. And he was a brave, brave little boy. And I could see yeah. it. Yeah, he, just had a, he had a fishbone stuck. 
ah, this looks really attractive, uh, deep in his throat, in his tonsil. And I looked in and I could see it just kind of sticking in the side of his throat. And really, I had to get to the reception. And so did he. And we went upstairs to the hotel room. His mother had a tweezer and we had a flashlight and he was super brave. And I took out the fishbone and all was well. And we went back to the party and he didn't wow. I instructed him. No fish, nothing with bones for the rest of the night because probably, I wanted to have fun. <laughs> he probably doesn't want to eat fish ever. Uh, yeah. So Let me tell fun. you, when a, when a child is cooperative like that, it's a, it's a dream to be a doctor. You know, I had another incident. We were at a bar mitzvah and, you know, they're all wearing suits. They're all 13. They're not used to it. It's hot in there. There's a lot of getting up and sitting down and there's a whole bunch of God going on. Right. And one of the friends of the bar mitzvah boy fainted. And, you know, hadn't eaten properly. It was early in the morning. And so his parents and I went out and took care of him and he was fine. And sometimes just uh, being able to reassure uh, people that they are fine, that, you know, when you don't have to do something emergently. So she's on call is a double or triple or quadruple entendre about the fact that we're on call for our patients, our their families, but our families and our communities and with this show, hopefully we'll be on call to the world at large and maybe share big shoes to fill. But let's yeah. let's, let's get share, to share, some share. share. Yeah. We uh, want to talk a little bit about a couple of the articles that came out. And so we do have a slide, I believe, that we want to go over. Uh, this was a study that um, the recovery uh, uh trial is like basically a huge study where they look at a bunch of different aspects of COVID-19. And this one, this article just came out that talked about a low cost use of a steroid, which is dexamethasone, that was shown to reduce death in up to one third of hospitalized patients with severe COVID. Um, so severe respiratory complications or, and they also showed a benefit in patients who were needed to have oxygen. And so, you know, people will ask many things, right? So does everyone who get COVID get cytokine storm? Um, the answer is no. So COVID stands for coronavirus disease. And the 19 means that the first official case was identified on December 31st, 2019. So that's why it's called COVID-19. So really, even though it seems like we've been living this for a lifetime, we've only been living with this for six months and learning about it every day. And we know that 90, 95% of people get self-limited disease and do not need to go to the hospital or get oxygen or get intubated. But a small and significant percentage get what's called a cytokine storm. So, Marina, you want to talk about what a cytokine storm is? I was like, cytokine storm, too much for everybody. But really what it means is that it's just a severe inflammatory response in your body. And that happens with certain diseases, and particularly in certain patients, you can get this severe inflammatory response with COVID-19. And when that occurs, patients are much sicker. So you can have someone have a severe response in the same family, and then everybody else in the family either doesn't get it, or just has a mild form of the disease. And that is what's interesting right now is trying to figure out why do some people get it worse than others? Uh, but what is important to note is that don't take steroids if you don't need it. If you don't have severe inflammatory response, if you happen to have COVID, taking a steroid won't prevent you from getting uh, the virus. It won't prevent you necessarily from you know, having a severe response. What this study looked at was giving patients a low-dose steroid uh, during their hospitalization, and that's where they saw the benefit when they had severe, di severe disease or required oxygen therapy. Yeah, and I think that's a really crucial point. Um, another uh, recovery study showed that there was no clinical benefit from using hydroxychloroquine in these very sick patients with COVID-19. So that study was actually stopped. So I think, you know, you pointed out to me earlier this week when we were talking that we just keep learning more and more and more about this disease. So don't go out and buy steroids. Don't go buy and go out and buy chloroquine. Um, but if you are very sick, uh, the dexamethasone is likely to help you and the chloroquine is not. 
Right. And then we learned about who gets sick, right? We, there was another study that we found kind of interesting. Yeah, this one is about blood types. I tweeted about this. I was kind of, okay, you know, it's very interesting. So this slide shows you what the blood type distribution is in the United States. So there's a lot of O, there's a fair amount of A, I think they're the two biggest, and there's B, and then AB is the rarest. Um, so what this particular study showed was that if you, the people that had uh, severe COVID disease, there seemed to be a greater number of type A blood types. And the people who had much less disease, it seemed to be the type O blood type was protective. However, don't stress about that, right? Like with type A, not, you know, as we said already, 90 to 95% of patients who get, who contract COVID are not going to get super sick. So don't worry. Um, but it's just more stuff that we're learning that, you know, us geeks, we're kind of like, hey, wow, that's kind of cool. What does that mean? You know, what is the interpretation going to be? So um, it's something that we're learning. And I think that if there is a blood type specific thing, and it really comes down to like the genomic or the genetic detail, then then we might be able to come up with future therapies. But that's going to take years to weeks, I mean, not years, months to years, not, not something that we can say, hey, turnkey, let's do this tomorrow. Right. I agree. Um, we have viewers watching from all over the world. I saw people watching from Bengaluru, which used to be called Bangalore when I lived there. Uh, in India, we have people watching from... Uh, Mexico. We have people watching from Florida. We have people watching from Canada. Uh, we have people watching from all over the country. Thank you so much. Please send in Jonathan Borstein. I'm going to be your best friend. I'm going to track you down in Union Square because you are just a loyal follower of news and facts, and I'm going to meet you one day. Um, we So please continue to like and share and follow. You can find us on Facebook, on Twitter, on YouTube, on LinkedIn, and please send in um, not just your congratulations, but thank you so much, Renee Edelman, uh, but your questions, because we have two amazing uh, physicians joining us today. So Marina, would you like to introduce them? Yeah. So Dr. Nadia Hernandez, again, she's an anesthesiologist who's going to be joining us, and Dr. Lilan Lee, who is uh, also an ENT resident uh, down in D.C. Welcome, you guys. Thank you. Thank you yeah. for having us. <laughs> Nadia is on call, so we managed to snag her. This is, you know, talk about she's on call. This is <laughs> not here. Nadia, I don't know. <laughs> we can have it, but that's what happened. But we're just excited to have you join us. And hopefully, I'm not going to say the Q word, which, you know, is the death knell for all call. Who will say, but <laughs> yes. <laughs> so thank you guys for coming aboard. Um, uh, we have so much to talk about. And uh, first of all, where where are you guys physically? How are you doing? How are you and your families managing through what we've been through the last few weeks or months? So Nadia? Um, so I live in Houston, Texas. And um, we obviously Texas is having um, it's a, a major wave right now of COVID. Um, we're mad. I, I personally am managing okay. I have a very strict decontamination process when I go home to my children. So um, the nanny knows that when I get home, she hides them. I have an outdoor shower and I, I have clean scrubs on that I take off and treat as they are dirty and completely decontaminate and then brush my teeth and, you know, Listerine the whole. And then I come in and interact with my children. I know some of my colleagues are living away from their families at the time so that they don't um, you know, infect them if they happen to be pre-symptomatic. But we're managing okay. So far, it's working for us. Your children are beautiful. And I have to tell everyone, I knew Nadia when she was an anesthesia resident up in Mount Sinai. And she was a crackerjack then. And your, your <laughs> car has just zoomed. So I'm so glad you could make the time. How about you, Lilone? How are you doing? Yeah, so I'm currently in Washington, D.C., um, starting my fifth year residency, and D.C.'s actually done a really good job flattening the curve. Um, people are staying home, uh, working from home, and our cases are pretty low in the hospital. But I agree with Nadia. Uh, I decontaminate. There's a whole process when I get home. Uh, and so far, uh, my close ones have been safe, and hopefully they'll stay that way. 
Yeah, I think um, everybody has their process, and it's 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 hopefully interesting to people listening to know that we all, when we come home, have our like little routines that we have to do to make sure that everybody else stays safe once we go into the hospital. Obviously, uh, New York City has done a fantastic job flatt- flattening the curve, and I think the governor just said the other day that our our infection rate was like one of the lowest in the country. Um, Nadia, why do you think what's what's happened in Texas? And you know, when we were uh, at, at our peak in in New York, some of our hospitals were the ICUs were overflowing. The operating rooms became ICUs. That happened certainly at uh, one of my institutions that I go to. Uh, and then several in the in the city. And then also what we found, and, and you went to Mount Sinai, so you know, Queens got hit super hard, um, the Bronx as well, and then Columbia uh, uh, up in uh, Washington Heights area, that also got hit. And so they had to create, um, you know, ICUs out of rooms. And it, it, it was a, there. that's when we saw our resources being overutilized. And that was when we were all sort of worried that what's going to happen if this gets worse. And so that when we flatten the curve, which, you know, is everybody sick of saying flattening the curve? Because probably we are. But um, once we did that, I think it made a huge difference in terms of decreasing our utilization. So when you guys are on the uptick in Houston or is it all over Texas? So many questions. Go ahead. (laughs) I think it's focused mostly on the big cities in Texas. Um, I think part of the problem was the early reopening without having um, an understanding that we needed to do it safely. Um, The mask situation in Texas is a big deal. The mayors of all the different big cities were advocating for enforcing um, mask use. Um, However, the governor um, sort of countered them, uh, saying that we're infringing on people's rights. And I want to say that was probably interpreted as it's not that important. So what we were seeing in Texas is people were, you know, congregating, um, not wearing masks. And as a result, we are about to be in a situation where, you know, New York was a couple of weeks ago where our we're overwhelmed. We're many hospitals are at capacity. Um, We're starting to become overwhelmed. And although we have the advantage of having space, um, we could probably create, thousands of ICU beds. Um, The issue is now who's going to staff those ICUs. Um, We don't have thousands of nurses just laying around not doing anything and doctors and respiratory therapists, etc. So I don't know, we're we're, we're we're about to be where New York was, I think. (laughs) You know, it was really hard up here. Um, Not only did we face a paucity of like the trained healthcare workers, nurses, doctors, respiratory therapists, as you said, but even um, patient transport, linen, uh, one of the audiologists, the people who test hearing here, uh, you know, she was dragged in to do linen and laundry in the hospital because somebody had to fold the linens and wash the linens so that patients could have their bedding changed. Uh, one of the other audiologists was pulled in. And if you called the switchboard in the hospital, you're like, hey, Lisa, what are you doing answering the phone? Because we need people at every level. And that's what we saw here. And we really hoped that the rest of the country learned from that. And I think um, I think the injection of politics into healthcare care um, uh, made the science not heard as well as it should. You know, even my mom, who's a physician, she's like, oh, come on. All you guys are saying is, you know, wear a mask, wash your hands, keep distance, wear a mask, wash your hands, keep distance. But that's actually the best medicine right now. And and we've done it up here in the Northeast. And we're seeing that flattening of the curve that we talked about, you know, in March. And unfortunately, we're seeing that curve rise in many cities. Um, what's going on in, in uh, D.C., Leland? So in D.C., uh, like I mentioned briefly, things are um, people are really abiding by the rules. Uh, The streets are fairly empty. People are wearing masks out and about. Um, And I think our hospital did a great job acquiring uh, uh, protective personal equipment for the healthcare workers. Um, Initially, in the beginning, you know, the masks were kind of um, put in separate areas so people wouldn't bring them home. Um, And, you know, we were all kind of dealing with using N95s during the day all the time. But now it's kind of just become part of the routine. Um, We're getting our PPE when we need them. 
Um, and then in terms of um, our ancillary staff, they were originally um, sent to do some other jobs. Like some of our uh, techs were sent to do fever checks at the front of the hospital. Um, but for now, I think our volume has gone back to normal and they're back to their original position. I think um, if you guys can, can you pull up that slide for us on the um on which, which states are seeing an uptick. And that will also be instructive, I think, for everyone that, um, you know, these are the places that um, have, the ones in pink are the ones that have a policy for um, wearing masks in public. And uh, we certainly have that in, in New York City. And what's funny is yesterday, oh, is it yesterday? Yeah, probably yesterday. I was I was out and I was thinking and I said to a, a friend, I'm like, look, everyone's wearing masks. Isn't that wonderful? I think in New York City, we're like 90 percent wearing masks. And then li literally I turned my head and then there were like four people who walked by without masks. But I think if the majority are doing it, I think that is, uh, is still leaps and bounds better. And in addition, there was some data this week. Um, and you could take that slide down. Most of you have something to say about it. There was data this week that suggested that what we're seeing for influenza, and, and now we're coming out of flu season, right? Over the summer months, we see less flu, but still when there, are as I said, troves of research here, um, as they're looking back through the past three months, they're seeing that there was a decrease in actual um, incidence of flu. So wearing masks, washing hands, all important. Funny thing, and I don't know if you guys have noticed this, but since everybody's using the bathroom right by the front door when they walk in, I'm like out of soap, right? And I'm thinking, <laughs> how come this never happened before? How come this <laughs> time to get, you know, and so I realized because everybody would walk in, not necessarily wash their hands or do it in, in their own bathroom or something like that. But I, first I was a little bit creeped out when I realized that was <laughs> reason. It's not because no one's washing their hands. So but I'm out of soap. This after the show, I got to go get some more. Yeah. <laughs> Dr. Dr. Lister would be very proud of your family, right? Dr. Lister was the guy in England who said the way we can reduce surgical infection rates is by surgeons washing their hands between patients. And he was almost run out of town as being a charlatan. But he was right. If if we just washed our hands in between patients, we didn't contaminate other patients. And I think that's the origin of Listerine, uh, which Nadia apparently uses frequently. So congratulations, Nadia. Um, let's move on a little bit. Um, we have seen this COVID pandemic grip our country, and then we saw the extremely harrowing, horrible murder of uh, Mr. George Floyd. And we saw these uprisings in the street. And, you know, as physicians, you know, we'd spent months saying, you know, stay away, social distance, wear masks. And we saw, for the most part, uh, the protesters were peaceful and were wearing masks and were, in fact, outdoors where it's a little it's a little less da uh, dangerous. But we did see some action with uh, what's called rubber bullets with tear gas. And Lilan, maybe you can explain your experience and what prompted you to write this really eloquent um, op-ed in the Washington Post shortly after the June 1st Lafayette Park uh, occurrences. Sure. Uh, so basically, I was on call uh, that Monday night where the Lafayette Square uh, shooting happened. And, you know, just kind of as a background, it was uh, a day where most of you guys saw President Trump um, on camera giving um, a speech about what was going on um, in light of the George Floyd incident. Uh, and, you know, Honestly, for me, I was in clinic till pretty late and I wanted to get home on time uh, before the curfew. There was a curfew set by Mayor Bowser um, in D.C. for 7 p.m. And at just around the time that I got home around 7, um, I was called by the emergency room and they said there was a patient who had been shot by a rubber bullet while in Lafayette Square. And um, they wanted me to come in to evaluate him. So I looked on the CT um, from my house and it was already very surprising just from the CT scan that there was a penetrating wound uh, through this man's chin all the way to his bone, um, to his jawbone about here. And, you know, I'd never seen a rubber bullet before. I've seen regular gunshot wounds, um, but, you know, rubber bullets aren't really used in public generally unless it's, 
you know, in these particular circumstances. So I looked it up on Wikipedia and found out that, you know, they're not just rubber. They have fragments of um, plastic. They have fragments of metal. And the rubber is just kind of the coating around the bullet. And, you know, when I went in, I wasn't really sure what to expect. Uh, so I saw the patient, you know, um, really gaping wound in his chin. And I ended up having to debride kind of the metal fragments, the plastic fragments out of his chin. Um, thankfully, it didn't really penetrate the bone and it didn't cause a bony fracture. So everything I did was at bedside and he was really tolerant of me doing all that. Um, and I closed him, uh, sutured him back up and sent him home. Uh, so that was kind of the circumstance of what happened. And that's hard. You know, you guys who are listening, you think, hey, you know, she was able to do it at the bedside. It's not so bad. I was just thinking, little, and how, like, your back must have been broken because you have to lean over somebody. To yeah. So, and you're at an awkward angle. It's not even like you're in the operating room. You're doing yeah. this in the ER. And then to me, when we talked earlier about how you fished a bone out of, literally fished a fish bone out of a, a child's tonsil, and you really need someone to hold still. I mean, all of us who have been in the emergency room, and Nadia, probably in your training, you were called out to help sedate a young child who was screaming and carrying on because they were not allowing, you know, any kind of suturing or any foreign body retrieval. So for you to... To do that and it requiring that at the bedside, but not, and it's probably, it was fairly deep, you said, if it was going yeah. down, that's multiple layers of suturing. Mm -hmm. And then, it's, come on, it's like in New York, you know, it has to be cosmetic too. Like, you're not, yeah. <laughs> the other layer of like, make it look real pretty, you know, so it all adds a lot of time and it takes up a lot of resources. So I it definitely does. Bullets had metal in them or plastic. That's, that really is a true, it's a weapon. It is. And again, like you said, um, it was done at bedside and he did get to go home, but it took hours, you know, and the patient was scared of needles. So we really had to calm him down before. Um, he was a great patient. Obviously, he was very cooperative, but it, you know, was a lot more traumatic for him, I think, psychologically having to undergo that um, than anything else. And I had actually offered um, possibly to go to the operating room, but, you know, he had family at home and you know, he didn't want to stay in the hospital with all the other COVID patients who were there. Um, so there were a lot of social factors that, you know, led us to pursue the bedside route. Um, and again, like you were saying, bedside procedure sounds pretty straightforward, but it was a lengthy procedure and he obviously had to tolerate that. So. And you know, this is, this is during COVID, right? This yeah. is during the time when you're taking extra precautions, mm -hmm. almost just to say hello to people, right? We're yeah. all wearing double masks and a uh, gown and gloves and eye mm -hmm. protection. So put all of that and a headlight yeah. uh, on and try to try to help somebody who is scared and you know very frightened and and appropriately scared of the lady leaning over him taking mm -hmm. fragments out of his face. Yeah. You know, a lot of times when oh, you're a stranger, no less, right? Like, yes. <laughs> stranger. Now everybody's a mass stranger. You walk into the hospital, everyone's wearing a mask. It used to be you could like establish a little rapport. Hey, I'm Dr. So-and-so. I'm here to try and help you, you know, uh, and then we're going to do this. I'm going to put a mask on. And now, no, you don't even, you, you, you see this much, yeah. you know, I've been meeting new patients in the office and they're like, they're looking at me because, I mean, obviously, they've seen pictures of me on my website. They're just like, I don't know. You don't, obviously, I don't look like my picture, right? <laughs> it's, it's so impersonal in a way. This, you know, it's not like we're uh, the Lone Ranger. And that was a different mask. Right. We have uh, people watching from all over. We've got people from Durham, North Carolina. We have people from uh, California. We have people telling me the salad bowl up in Northern California is still the cases are rising. So even though the state as a whole looks good, there are pockets everywhere that are still rising. Monarch Mech asks, is there a safer alternative? Is there a safer alternative to be hit with rubber bullets? Yeah, don't be hit with any bullet. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think that... Um, it's not I, like, as I said last night, it's not like me taking a bullet and throwing something, right? Like my colleague, I threw a ball for the, a dog and she was like, 
give me that. I'm going to throw it better than you. I was like, okay, <laughs> it's clearly not got an arm, whatever. But it's not like I'm throwing a little rubber bullet at you, but it's coming out as a missile. So of course it's going to be painful. And of course it can cause damage, and especially if it just catches you the wrong way, right? If it, It's just, um, there's not a safer alternative. And I think that, that probably the issues are as everyone's tempers were up, the passions were flaring, and also we had COVID. And so just... I think all that war, you know, all the anxiety that people are having I mean, when we're doing telehealth and we're seeing patients, everyone's anxious. They're, you know, they're scared about the future. They want to get out, but then they're afraid. Then they're all out. And then they see this huge police presence. It, it, I understand why they felt they needed to do crowd control, but it, it, uh, unfortunately there's some serious uh, issues with that. So little one, thank you so much for posting that. Yeah, now, what have you seen in terms of, of what you do in anesthesia, like just tell people what it is that you do. And cause you know, Sujan and I were saying, you know, what we tell our patients, yeah, you got to go under. I, or you say they need anesthesia. I am like, you got to go under. And they're like, what's that, what's that mean? Right. <laughs> <laughs> there, there are so many different ways to provide anesthesia and um, I, I can break it down probably into the most basic form. So um, either usually it requires a discussion with the surgeon about the patient, the patient's comorbidities and the procedure that they're going to do. Um, and we come up with a plan as, as far as what is the best thing that we can do for that particular patient. Um, so sometimes it's determined by the procedure, but also sometimes it's determined by the patient's medical status. Um, if the surgeon needs the patient to not move at all and muscles to be paralyzed in order to access certain parts of the body or maybe put bones, align bones, um, and they need, they need the paralysis, then, you know, you're sort of uh, stuck having general anesthesia, unless it's in a, a part of your arm that we can just sort of block. But so general anesthesia just means um, that we have, you are completely um, unconscious and that we are um, controlling your breathing, um, either with our a mask or with um, a special mask that goes in the back of the throat or with a breathing tube and collect, connected to a ventilator. Um, then there's options to not have general anesthesia. So we can do procedures under nerve blocks. Um, if, we, if the procedure is isolated to a certain portion of the body, we use an ultrasound to find the nerves that innervate that region. And we anesthetize them. It's kind of like when you go to the dentist and they give you a shot in the back of the jaw. And sort of your whole jaw goes numb. We can do the same thing for body parts. Um, so if that's the case, then we, we usually stand there and provide just a little bit of sedation to help you sleep. And then the other option is um, uh, what we call monitor anesthesia care, which is MAC, which really just means that we're standing there and um, it may it, we may just be giving oxygen uh, or we may be giving a little bit of medicine, but sort of helping the patient get through the, the painful procedures with just a little bit of sedation. Um, sometimes this is done without an anesthesiologist if, if it's a healthy patient. Um, but if they're, you know, they require a little bit more management, then an anesthesiologist gets involved. So those are the sort of the general um, options. Now, um, in addition to nerve blocks, um, if the procedure is focused on the bottom half of the body, um, we can inject medicine, the same medicine, numbing medicine directly sort of into the CSF where the spinal cord and the nerves live and block half of the body. It's called a spinal which most women get for C-sections. Um, that's also another option, but we sort of group that in with regional as well. You know, a couple of years ago, I uh, did the ultimate old lady thing and I just took a step and I wasn't paying attention and I broke my fibula. So I broke the smaller of the two bones in my lower leg and I had to have surgery on it. Even though I tried to convince the orthopedic surgeon that ah, I don't really need a fibula, he said, "Yeah, you need your <laughs> fibula fixed." Um, and I had a really cool ultrasound and regional nerve block, and the anesthesiologist saw that I was a super nerd and allowed me to watch uh, while while he did the ultrasound and found the nerve, and I could feel it block. Um, and I I'm really impressed with the the way. Um, the machinery has uh, gotten smaller and the technology has gotten better. And I saw on your on your Twitter feed today that you had posted a way to do it safely during COVID uh, with pictures. So maybe you can talk about that sort of ultrasound guided uh, nerve blocks, which I think are really cool. 
So I happen to be, so I'm an anesthesiologist by training, but I happen to specialize in nerve blocks and acute pain management, which is right up my alley. So thank you for that question. <laughs> um, so we, we do we do nerve blocks for, for anesthesia, but we also do them to control post-operative pain or pain associated with um, trauma. And so the picture that I posted um, was related to a patient who um, fell from standing and broke their hip. Uh, we go down to the emergency room and we do the nerve block um, so that they won't get high dose opioids for pain and, and end up in a very confused state. Um, now, the challenge is, especially in Texas, that everybody's testing positive for COVID as they come in. Um, and how can we go into these rooms safely with our equipment and do these procedures? So what I posted was um, a pocket ultrasound that I have. Um, we put it inside of a, a sterile sheath. And in, which included the phone, which makes it easier for us to go into these rooms because we have on our, our full PPE. But now my, my equipment has on full PPE as well. <laughs> and uh, we're able to localize tissue planes, nerves, bones that um, lead us to inject numbing medicine exactly where we want to put it. Um, and then when we're done with the procedure, instead of having to wipe down um this large machine, um, we able to sort of just hand over the clean um, ultrasound and phone to the nurse. And um, there you go. Showing it. <laughs> yeah. it, you know, it's really cool. The things you learn during COVID are that your phone works under plastic. <laughs> Why is it that it doesn't work when you have you need a special glove to like touch it? But look, you have a glove on and it's working through plastic. So hello, thank you, Apple or Samsung, for making these upgrades. Like <laughs> COVID so, up I want to say our uh, one of our guests from last week's uh, premiere show, Hafia Eltahar, uh, just said hi and thank you, Hafia. She's a resident at New Jersey Medical School mm -hmm. and. Uh, she was fantastic last week, as, along with Dr. Dara Cass from uh, Emergency Medicine. So we're so happy to grow our family like this. Uh, we've had people uh, uh, texting in and, and sending messages. And my daughter, who's 15, says the best alternative uh, to rubber bullets is to not shoot people. <laughs> <laughs> And I think the safer alternative is not shooting at protesters. Um, she's a logical girl. I, I guess she got it from her dad. Happy Father's Day to her dad. <laughs> um, I'm wondering, Lilan, uh, you know, your specialty is ENT, like mine, but unlike me who went to the E, you're going down to the T. You're going down to the throat. And I, I know, I know. Yes. <laughs> we all have our <laughs> And then instead of doing all people, you want to do pediatrics. Yes. So maybe you can talk to our listeners and our viewers about what um, what pediatric ENT is and maybe what parents should look for, especially since children and small children are spending a lot more time in homes that may not be ideally child-proofed uh, once the baby is, you know, over two years old. Yes. So, uh, yes, I'm very interested in pediatric otolaryngology, um, and I love working with kids. They have a, um, some of the diseases are similar and some of them are a little bit different. And I think, um, one of the things that, you know, we were talking about was that kids are staying home more now, uh, not going to school as much. And, you know, they're, you know, with their family at home more, but not necessarily with as much supervision. And um, one of the things that happens that we see a lot of is foreign body ingestion. Uh, and sometimes they have really acute onset. And so parents come in with their kids choking or coughing a lot um, and they had an inciting incident. So the parents saw, you know, that the kid had been playing around and choked on a piece of a toy or um, were playing around and swallowed a button battery. So those are pretty um kind of straightforward cases, you bring them to the emergency room and the kid gets a workup and possibly would need to get the foreign body removed. Um, and again, in those instances, if you see that happening and if your kid is having those significant symptoms of, you know, again, choking, coughing, difficulty breathing, then obviously going straight into the emergency room for uh, professional help. Um, then there are kind of more subtle signs where a child might have 
accidentally ingested something, again, toys, coins, um, button batteries, nuts, you know, popcorn kernels, things like that. And they weren't really seen, you know, the parent might have been turned away. um, And it's unclear if they really swallowed something or choked on something. But um, and sometimes they may not present with kind of the choking or immediate respiratory uh, distress. But, you know, if a child is con- uh, constantly coughing, chronically coughing with no real source or otherwise not um, sick or anything, um, if they're having pain with swallowing, if they're drooling more than usual, um, and if they have this constant irritation in the back of the throat or, you know, the pain, um, you may want to consider getting it evaluated as well because they could have a foreign body that's lodged in either, you know, the esophagus or the food pipe or the airway, um, the windpipe. And it could just be sitting there for a while um, and, you know, probably needs to get removed. So all the right, because a lot of times, I mean, we, so do, we, we, have, we have kids, Lillian, you may not, but like, you yeah. know, they're like drooling and yeah. getting a throat pain. I'm thinking strep throat or to cold yeah. like that. And I'm, I'm very unlikely to think it's, it's a foreign body, but it's an excellent yeah. point. And those watch batteries are like the worst, right? And if you yeah. have around they're like hey is this like candy like a dime you know or smaller than a dime and they can easily swallow it and get stuck yeah so the batteries are really scary they're one of the um things that really prompt urgent uh consultation and you know definitely bring your kids to the emergency room if you saw them swallowing the battery and i think one of the things that was interesting that i learned um was that chop did a study a few years back and if you see your kid um ingesting a battery then on route to the hospital, or even as you're calling and waiting for the ambulance or whatever to get there, having the child just take in some honey helps to neutralize um, the battery and prevents as much caustic injury um, as it can before uh, going to get further workup. So I think that's something that parents can easily do. Um, usually people have honey at home and, you know, just to have that around and having the kid take that um, as they're getting personal help. Everyone needs honey at home. I can't yeah. believe that. That is amazing. Yeah. Really interesting. Yeah. You know, it's always nice when the doctors learn something too. So thank yeah. you. Yeah, they they tried a lot of different agents and they found that honey was, you know, again, very easily accessible and really helped prevent um, the degree of caustic injury from these batteries. We're because, not you know, the, the battery acid can burn through mucosa. Mm-hmm. Right? So not only is it horrible to swallow a battery, but then if it's if it stays there and it's not so long that it takes, yeah. it can really burn through and make mm-hmm. holes in your in your esophagus in your swallowing wow. tube so that's that and chop for people who don't know is the children's hospital of philadelphia and it's associated with the university of pennsylvania we use a lot of acronyms in medicine <laughs> doctors are sitting around talking nobody knows what we're saying to each other but it's really uh <laughs> we're gonna have to have an ophthalmologist on because i don't understand anything that they're no, saying i don't even understand <laughs> a little abbreviation so and the other nice thing about honey by the way i mean like if you guys plant i'm not a gardener but my girlfriends that are they all plant things that are uh for pollinators so that bees will come because of course we we're having a bee problem right mm. that's likely so we need bees to make honey and yeah. now you know honey is so amazing so I'll tell you, we have a few minutes left. We're getting uh, greetings from all over the place. My friend Irene, who I went to high school with, is now living in Texas. We have a lot of Texans tuned in today. And and a lot of places, people saying that um, their, their mask wearing is really quite poor uh, in many parts of the country, unfortunately. Um, but I'm, I think I'm learning a lot today. One of the things that our viewers may not know is that when a when a child swallows a foreign body or inhales a foreign body and it goes down their windpipe, that's actually when Nadia and Lilan work together. And maybe Nadia, you can talk about, you know, you talked about talking with the surgeon and comorbidities. And I, and I think communication is just so vital in all aspects, but in the airway, in the pediatric airway, maybe you can talk a little about what you'd be asking Lilan and, and how you'd be setting things up and preparing uh, for a safe retrieval of that foreign body. Oh, I lost Nadia. I lost you guys too. Okay. I can hear you. We can hear you. Oh, I'm getting a phone 
on call. That's the issue. Sorry. <laughs> I'm, on, I'm on call. Maybe Leela can start. Okay, we'll leave them alone. Leela, what, what, what would you tell your anesthesiologist? Sure. So agree completely that um, it's a very close relationship, especially in these foreign body cases, um, especially in smaller children whose airway diameters are really small. Um, they can you know, lose an airway really fast and um, lose their oxygen levels um, really fast. So, you know, figuring out a way um, to do an accurate diagnostic um, laryngoscopy and bronchoscopy to try to figure out where the foreign body is while allowing the patient to get receive oxygen from the anesthesia end. Um, so the kind of various things we can do. And I think Nadia can talk more about that. Um, when she's back on the line, um, but just kind of coordinating to make sure, you know, when my instrument is in there, um, the anesthesiologists are um, aware that I'm manipulating the airway um, and, you know, I can pull out the bronchoscope or lowering the scope if they need to ventilate the child. Um, and I'll let Nadia speak more to that. This is just one of those cases where you do, you're right, we do have to work in conjunction because it's sort of a um, combined management of the airway. Um, and it, it again, it depends on where we think this foreign body is stuck. Um, if it's sort of in, in the proximal oral pharynx um, and they just need a little bit of putting in a breathing tube to keep them safe, maybe because they ate, I think, um, can happen. Um, if the patient just ate, giving them sedation is actually very dangerous um, because you lose your reflexes. And if anything comes back up, it can go into your lungs and cause some really bad problems. So it's, it, it's a lot of factors to consider whether or not we're just going to do a little bit of sedation so they can go in and get something that's, you know, very superficial or whether they need to be really deep and we need to protect their airway um, even further before that, uh, foreign body dislodges and goes, you know, deeper into the body. So there's lots of uh, options here. We want to talk about something else that's a little bit controversial. I think one of the things um, that that we found being women uh, physicians is that sometimes we're met with um, issues. So one thing that came up in Twitter uh, recently, and, you know, our executive producer, Sri Srinivasan, you know, kind of, uh, blew up social media by announcing when he had, um, when he was looking for a new job, right? Because that's not usually the thing. And so this was an, a, a way of using social media to um, help yourself, but also it was a great way of allowing people to know that, you know, this thing happened, but I'm moving forward and this is what, you know, this is a way to help. And it opened, I think, my eyes to how social media can be used in many different ways. So this week, there was a uh, surgical, um, no, actually an oncologist from um, Stanford that on Twitter broke her story that she was moving from Stanford to Yale and the reasons behind uh, doing it. So Sujana, you want to talk a little bit about Dr. Kunz? Right. So Dr. Kunz uh, had been at Stanford for 19 years, had done her internship, her residency, her post uh, postgraduate training, uh, was on staff there and found... and wrote on Twitter that as she moved up, she faced such gender harassment uh, because of her success that she could not abide it any longer. She was grateful to those who were supportive of her, her patients, her colleagues, but she couldn't abide it and she left. And she's going over to Yale now, starting July 1st, which for those of you who don't know, that's the beginning of our academic year in medicine. Um, and when we looked into this, you know, JAMA, the Journal of the American Medical Association, had a study on self-reported sexual harassment in academic medicine, and uh, women reported 30%, 30% of women reported sexual harassment, whereas only 4% of male physicians did. So this is women physicians in academics versus male physicians. And of the women who reported the harassment, 40% said it was severe, 59% said it decreased their confidence, and 47% said that it caused negative career effects. And, um, you know, I, it really pains me that in 2020, this is what we're talking about still. Uh, and I wonder, uh, either Lilan or Nadia, if you feel comfortable talking about either your experiences or experiences you've seen other people have or ways, in fact, that you are trying to combat this where you are. And I know, Nadia, your institution has a beautiful 
uh, diversity initiative going on. Yeah, um, I think many women experience this and a lot of us are very, um, we're sort of afraid to talk about it um, for fear of repercussion. So um, myself included, <laughs> you can imagine somebody who, who looks like me, a young female, um, appears to be single because I don't share my personal life. Um, I get a lot of... Um, inappropriate comments. One time, um, a surgeon, sorry, it was a <laughs> surgeon, but a surgeon called into my, the operating room where I was working and asked the resident, my resident, if, uh, if I was single and if I would go out with him while I was at work, um, which, you know, I'm, I'm loud and uh, I'm not afraid to share my opinion. So that didn't go very well. Um, but these things happen. Um, and, it's unfortunate that we have to deal with this this day and age. Um, but luckily for us, we do have each other to support each other. And um, I have a lot of he for she's behind me, um, which help, you know, bring me up and redirect me when I when I get distracted by this negativity. So I just stick with my group of supporters and, and it can drown be, out. It can be. Um sexual harassment, but as we also say, it's like a gender discrimination as well, where you're not allowed opportunities um, if, if, you're, if you're female or if you're underrepresented minority or if for whatever reason, someone just doesn't like you. They don't really need a reason. And this used to happen in the old days way more often, I believe. I know that um, that, that slide was actually uh, from uh, University of Michigan. They have an incredible initiative for um, hiring people, uh, diverse uh, creating a diverse department and keeping that diversity on every level at every committee level within the institution. I have good friends that are there and they've done just a spectacular job. Um, Lillian, do you think, I, I would say that for myself in my training, um, I can see where the guys and the girls were treated a little bit differently. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it also depended on the personality of the individual and um I don't know. I, I, I'm. Sh I didn't feel that I was necessarily mm -hmm. discriminated against at all. Um, yeah. But I was also more of a tomboy. So, you know, I don't know if that made uh, made a difference or not. And I think nowadays in, in training, Lil, if you could tell us how you feel. Yeah. Definitely. So, training, oh. right? Yeah. So it's interesting because um, when I was an intern, probably four years ago, I um, was part of an intern class that was all men. And that included, you know, we were surgical interns, so it was general surgery, um, orthopedic surgery, neurology, uh, neurosurgery, and it was just myself and one other female intern, um, and she was a neurosurgery intern. So, you know, it was, we had an intern room where we did a lot of um, kind of chart checking and doing daily, um, you know, like note writing, et cetera. And it just felt kind of like a boys locker room. Um, no one was explicitly sexist or anything. And I felt like for the most part, um, I was comfortable being there, but just in surgery generally, there are so many men at all levels that we tend to be the minority. Um, and, you know, depending on the personality, like you were saying, if you were more comfortable, like if you were a tomboy or something, you probably fit in better into that locker room culture. Um, but obviously I think the more diverse um, both the attending and resident uh, classes can be, the um, more inclusive, you know, the program can be. Yeah, I, you know, I will tell you, um, one day we'll dish and we'll talk about all the horrible experiences because they were horrible. Um, and I was so sad to see this this week because the horrible experiences that happened in the 80s and the 90s to people like me should not still be happening in 2020. I remember our little uh, call room the boys put up all these Playboy centerfolds. Blech. So one of the drug reps asked me what I'd like. And I said, I would like a copy of Playgirl. <laughs> Back in those days, the Playgirl centerfolds actually wore underwear because we were apparently very modest, even when we were sexual. 
And I just put up the Playgirl centerfold and immediately the Playboy centerfolds came down because I was like, I can't ask you guys to not make this disgusting. So I'm going to make it more disgusting. And then everything came down. Um, and I think you have to be a little bit tough to do that. Um, AJ Nathan, who is a, a third rising third year medical student at Boston University wrote, um, we need more women leadership and women are now the majority in medical school. We are, we're about 51% of medical students and we need see, to see that better reflected at the top and talk about he for she. I think that we have so many uh, male advocates um, that makes it easier or less difficult for us to confront the male bullies that we encounter. I had, I had one guy, I mean, my residency was, you know, when wheels were square and there were no women almost in the residency program. And one of the guys in, I uh, had spent two or three months with him on vascular surgery and he sat me down on the last day and he said, you know, he was really disgusting. He would say dead baby jokes. He would say all gross jokes, but sometimes they were funny. So I'd come back the next day and I'd say, Oh, I told my dad that joke. That was kind of funny. And he'd look at me funny. And at the end of three months, he said to me, I've been trying to make you cry for three months. And I said, oh, you should have wasted your time. You should have told me to cry on day one. I would have cried. We'd have been done. You know, like, I don't understand that statement, but sorry for you, because that's a big waste of your time. Um, but I think that these are these uh, biases, whether they happen because of gender, because of ethnicity, because of um, sexual um, orientation, uh, uh, our LGBTQ brothers and sisters um, are experiencing this. Um, I think, I hope that by having more diverse leadership um, as we go forward, we are able to uh, avoid this very unnecessary part of training and part of life. And I and I do think uh, Nadia and Lilun, um, you know, when you talk about your experiences, I think there are not only he for she, but there is a lot of women who support other women. There are a lot of women we can go to in our hospitals who will hear and see when guys might not hear or see. And I think, um, you know, ensuring that we are not mistreated by our patients or by our colleagues is really important. Yeah, I think that's very true. Um, we are sort of out of time, so we want to thank you, ladies, so much for joining us. And perhaps you know we'll do another show on on gender discrimination and uh, or or just discrimination in general in medicine, medicine because we do need to change that. Um, but thank you, Nadia Hernandez, again. She's an associate you. professor uh, at UT Houston. Thank you so much for joining us on call. Amazing. Thank you. And Lula and Lee, thank you so much also for joining us again. She is a fifth year resident. In ENT uh, in, in in DC, and she's going. You're at MedStar, right? Uh, uh, at George Washington. George Washington, and she's going to um, do a pediatric uh, otolaryngology fellowship. So, congratulations to you, and good luck, and thank you so much for joining. Mm -hmm. To those of you guys watching, thank you so much. I, I have friends also, Nancy from Indiana, Hoosier, and <laughs> uh, Brad from North Carolina as well, and and Debbie from Upstate New York in Albany. Thank you so much, you guys, for watching and sharing and liking our page. We really appreciate it. Again, we want to give a shout out to Scroll In for um, you know, sharing this with their viewership, which we really appreciate. It's wonderful. This is our team, our uh, producers, our, our design director. I want to thank everybody that was involved. Uh, so do you want to introduce the next show? Sure. I want to say please keep posting and uh, liking and sharing. Uh, thank you to our dads for believing in us all the time. It wasn't hard. It wasn't easy to raise opinionated girls like Marina and me. So thank you to both of our dads and happy Father's Day. Next Sunday, we'll be live again at 11 o'clock uh, Eastern time till 12 with more medical information and two new guests, Dr. Olga Garcia and Dr. Jordana Cohen. So Please continue to like and subscribe and follow and invite your friends. And if anybody wants to see today's show or last week's show, uh, they are archived on our She's On Call YouTube channel and uh, hashtag She's On Call. So thank you guys so much for tuning in, for all your comments, for 
watching and appreciating from around the world, around the country. Um, it was great to see your names pop up uh, in the feed. Yeah. Actually, it's also super fun for me to hang out with Sujana, even if it's online. So thank you, <laughs> Sujana, because that was really fun. I want to definitely thank our team again, because you guys have been awesome. And thank you to the viewers, because, uh, you know, this is why we're we're here, because we feel that we are uh, helping educate some, some people and hopefully making um, learning fun. Thank you. Stay safe and stay healthy. And happy Father's Day to everybody. Happy Father's Day.